Welcome to the presentation about the Urban Mobility Action Track. My name is Stefan Werland. I'm a researcher at the Wuppertal Institute for Climate, the Environment and Energy. The Action Tracker is designed as a tool to understand the purpose of cities in achieving mobility-related objectives and targets. It complements indicator systems such as sustainable urban mobility indicators by adding a future-looking policy dimension. That means it looks at targets and objectives, but also on policy measures and activities that cities use or implement to achieve a more sustainable urban mobility system. Now, the Action Tracker is about understanding transitions. And if you're familiar with transition literature, you will recognize those three forms of transition knowledge. Transition knowledge is knowledge that actors need to govern transition processes or transformative processes. Those three kinds of knowledge comprise knowledge about the current state of a system, which is called system knowledge. It's questions about how a system performs and how it fulfills its functions, for example, in terms of passenger care. Or which impacts does a system have on its environment? Think of greenhouse gas emissions or noise and air pollution. And finally, it is about how a system is organized and how it works. For instance, do departments cooperate or how is the distribution of modal shares? And second, actors need knowledge on the desired future state of the system, which is called target knowledge. This target knowledge uses the same indicators as the system knowledge. The question is, how should the system in the future look like? And finally, there is transition knowledge. This is knowledge about the ways how to achieve the desired state, how to come from the system to the target. This is knowledge about policy activities and instruments. And you will recognize these dimensions as the elements of the tracker as outlined before. Mobility, including urban mobility, is a multi-level policy field. That means that political decisions that influence the mobility system are taken on different levels. For example, vehicle emission standards are decided on the European level, taxation is determined mostly on the national level, same as subsidies, premiums or procurement programs for vehicles or the CO2 intensity of the electricity mix, which is important for the environmental performance of e-mobility, is determined on the national level. The tracker focuses on the urban and the regional level and on the activities of local decision makers which influence urban mobility systems. As a structuring element, we use the ecosystem approach, which was developed in Sprout and which breaks down the urban mobility system into six dimensions. Governance, climate and environment, accessibility, safety, resources, and stakeholders. And for each of those elements, we use this triple approach to understand the state, the objectives, and the activities of urban decision makers. In the upcoming slides, I will give an outline of the first findings of the track. You need to be aware that these are the results of a test run with Sprout Cities, which was meant to assess the feasibility of the track. And due to the limited number of 14 participating cities, the results are of course not representative. Nevertheless, we think they can provide interesting insights and data quality will improve the more cities complete this survey. I will restrict to some findings that we found particularly interesting and more encompassing results are provided in the Sprout D6.2 report. The link is provided in the materials section. The governance section looked at the state of mobility planning and at the core indicators such as model splits. It also assessed whether cities use their purchasing power to influence urban mobility. First, I would like to give an overview about which kinds of cities have responded. All cities that responded either do have a recent sustainable mobility plan, a mobility plan that is more than five years old, or they are currently reviewing this sum. That means that all cities do have experience with sustainable urban mobility planning. That also means that there might be a bias towards cities that have already recognized the importance of sustainable urban mobility, which we should keep in mind when interpreting the results. The European Urban Mobility Framework explicitly mentions an integrated urban mobility strategy that cities should have. And this is why we asked cities how the cooperation between the mobility and the land use planning department is organized. What we found is that all cities had some kind of cooperation between the mobility and the land use department. Most of the cities either relied on ad hoc arrangements, that means not systematically organized meetings, or institutionalized meetings on a regular basis. Only a small share of cities we found used or implemented an institutional innovation, such as joint planning departments or multi-departmental teams, which are referred to, for example, in the SUM guidelines. The tracker also considers mobility-related targets. In the area, we asked for modal split targets, which are key indicators for describing the characteristics of the urban mobility system. In this case, we focused on the targets for reducing car use, which is the key for getting away from private car use and at the core of the sustainable mobility transition. Here we found that less than half of the cities 
do have targets for reducing car use. What the tracker then does is to qualify this data. For this, we use the required annual change rate to achieve the target. For example, a city could pledge to achieve a car share of 30% in 2030, which would go down from 40% in 2018. We then calculated the required annual change, assuming a linear reduction. We found that all answers went towards reducing car use, and the range of responses was between 7% and 2.8% for the less ambitious cities, with an average of 4.3%. Finally, as an example for more specific policy action, we asked whether cities use the purchasing power to influence the urban mobility system. In this case, we asked whether cities have implemented environmental criteria in public delivery contracts. Other examples are, for example, the procurement of e-buses, which is mentioned in a later chapter. We found here that roughly half of the cities did make use of environmental criteria in delivery contracts. Key indicators for the ecosystem element climate and city typology are transport-related greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution or the share of locally emission-free vehicles. On the policy side, we looked at the procurement of e-buses and had plans to implement zero-emission zones. We started with systems knowledge about transport-related greenhouse gas emissions and found that less than half of the cities responded, so there seems to be a knowledge gap in many cities. Validation of the data that we got took place through comparing them to national data from the EEA Greenhouse Gas Data Bureau. We found that cities at a range between 800 and 1,500 kilogram CO2 per capita in year. Run City reported in CO2 equivalents rather than in CO2. It's not possible to calculate back CO2 equivalents to CO2 emissions because there is no universal conversion factor since the CO2 equivalents are based on a specific composition of different greenhouse gases with diverging global warming potentials. So here we suggest to come to a harmonization on the European level. Based on this system knowledge, we asked whether cities had CO2 emission targets for transport. We found that less than half of the cities had such a target. For those cities that indicated to have CO2 targets, we used the same approach as with the reduction of car use. So we calculated the required annual change, assuming a linear pathway to come from the base year to the target year. What we found is that targets range between 11% reduction per year and more or less stabilizing CO2 emissions. Regarding transport-related air pollution, we looked at NO2 and PM10. We compared the level to externally given benchmarks, which is the World Health Organization standards and the EU Air Quality Directive. For NO2, which you see in the graph, we see that one city achieved the WHO standards and one city exceeded the European limits. It needs to be noted that the directive, that the European directive is currently under review and we have probably tighter standards. That means that the upper gray line will go down. So there will be movement in this score in the coming years. So one way to reduce local emissions from transport is the use of e-vehicles. And we asked cities about the share of battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles in the existing fleet and in the new registered vehicles. We also asked about the development of charging infrastructure. Surprisingly, we found a very weak databases here and decided not to report on the results, but to keep an eye on the data availability for the future. And while the electrification of vehicle fleets is mostly determined in the European and the national level, as explained before, there are two specific measures that cities can take to defuse zero emission vehicles. First is the procurement of e-buses and second to plan to introduce a zero emission zone. So first, looking at the share of e-buses, we found that there is quite good data availability. So we have 80% of response rate there. We found a range between 25% in a smaller town with only few buses, while other cities do not have any e-buses. We expect a very high dynamic in this indicator. It will be interesting to monitor the diffusion of e-buses over the coming years. The second measure on the city level is the announcement of the zero emission zone. Here we found that almost half of the cities have announced to introduce such a zone while no city has yet implemented one. It needs to be mentioned that not all cities are in a legal position to introduce emission zones. For example, the national legal framework might not allow this. And that such measures require advanced time for citizens to adopt their purchase decisions. But still, the pro-announcement of plans to introduce a zero emission zone sets clear signals for car purchases and influences the future fleet composition. For the accessibility ecosystem element, we looked at collective public transport, which will remain the backbone of mobility in the coming years. Indicators are the mode share public transport, the shared population in catchment areas of public transport stations, or development of the service of 
and related policy activities most we refer to the costs of public transport. Looking at the modal share of public transport as one system indicator, we found first of all a very high data availability, only one city did not provide data, and also a wide range of answers ranging from 45% in one city to 1% in another. To understand the availability of public transport, we used the share of population living within 300 meters of a bus at a tram stop and within 500 meters from a light rail station. This indicator is linked to the SUMI 6 and the Sustainable Development Goal Indicator 11. Data availability was only moderate, with 75% of cities providing information, so we decided to simplify this indicator for later rounds. What we found is again a broad range from 95% in one city down to 50% in another city. We also found that more than 60% of cities have integrated on-demand services with collective public transport in order to fill service gaps in areas and times with limited service levels. As an indicator to understand the affordability of public transport, we compared the price of a monthly pass to the average monthly net income. And the resulting range of answers reached from less than 2% to more than 9%. One factor that determines user behavior are the costs of different mobility options. What we did here is to compare the direct cost of public transport to the direct cost of car use. And direct costs are those costs that you immediately notice. For the indicator, we use those costs that can be determined on the city level. That means cost for a single public transport ticket on the one hand, compared to cost of one hour parking in the inner city on the other hand. And what we found here again was a wide range of answers, ranging from parking costs being one third of a public transport ticket to parking costs being three times more expensive than public transport. And this again shows the influence that cities have on cost structures and also on user behavior. Under the safety and security ecosystem element, we specifically looked at the conditions for vulnerable road users. We looked at the share of fatalities and severely injured cyclists and pedestrians, but also infrastructures and speed limits to protect them. The share of vulnerable road users of all transport-related fatalities is one indicator that we used. Here again, the database was weaker than expected, with only 60% of cities providing data on killed vulnerable road users. In all cases except one, at least 50% of transport-related fatalities came from this group. Ranges here reached up to 75%. On the policy side, we asked cities to indicate the share of urban roads with a speed limit of 30 km per hour or lower. Reducing the speed of car traffic is a means to increase the safety for cyclists, thereby promoting the use of bikes without the need to build new infrastructure. What we found is that one city had over 80% share of slow roads, where the majority only had around 10%. So, the allocation and use of urban resources refers to two aspects. First, the use of urban space, and second, the allocation of public budget. Pricing parking is one way of managing the use of scarce urban space. The question that cities face is, do I give it away for free, or do I try to make users pay a more or less adequate share of the costs? What we found is that all cities have introduced parking management, most of them in the city centre and in certain areas beyond, and only few in the entire city area or only in parts of the city centre. So the other set of parking management is the reallocation of on-street parking spaces. The idea is that if you want to promote active mobility and public transport, you should also discourage car use and provide space for other modes. So our question was whether cities are planning or actually redistributing urban space by removing on-street car parking spaces. And what we found was that the majority of cities are actively or at least planning to reduce the number of on-street parking spaces. Today, most parking spaces are built on private property. And one way of influencing the number of those private parkings, at least in new developments, are building codes. These building codes traditionally set minimum numbers of parking spaces for per residential unit. More recently, some cities went towards relaxing these standards or even towards limiting the number of parkings per unit. What the tracker found was that while minimum standards are still the default case, some cities have implemented restrictions on parkings in new developments. And finally, we also asked cities for information on the allocation of public financial resources to different mobility modes. We wanted to understand which share of public mobility budget is going into cycling measures, what is going into public transport, and how much is going into road infrastructure. But unfortunately, here again, we found that the database was too weak to report any results yet. So regarding the infrastructure, we considered both the physical side of the mobility system, that means roads, buildings, but also vehicles, and the digital side, which is apps or data. 
Here we asked about the regulation of new mobility solutions, in this case shared micro vehicles. The idea is that cities should be both facilitators and regulators of new privately operated mobility options. And regulating parking in urban space, which is a resource, is one of the approaches for cities to steer the use of shared vehicles. So what we find was that in some cities there were no private operators active. We also found that a small number of cities do not regulate parking at all. Found that the highest share of cities used voluntary agreements with the providers. And roughly half of the cities have either implemented parking regulations or also provided parking spaces which are mandatory to use. So on the digital infrastructure side, we assessed whether cities do have a mobility app, which is the basis for integrated intermodal trips, and which functions this app has. What we found is that actually most cities do have an app and that all of those apps have a ticketing function for public transport. On the other hand, we also found that only two cities have an app with shared mobility office integrated to different degrees. We also asked whether the providers of new mobility solutions were obliged to share their data with public administrations in the sprout cities. What we found is that less than half of the cities made data provision mandatory and a bit more than 25% each either had no data sharing agreement or only voluntary agreements between the providers and the public administration. And finally, we also had a look at the infrastructure for sustainable urban logistics. And here we assessed the availability of micro depots for sustainable urban logistic concepts. What we found is that more than half of cities have not yet implemented micro depots. Roughly one third has permanent micro depots and one city is experimenting with the concept. So to conclude, what we found first is the tracker tool is feasible. It is a tool to understand where cities stand compared to their peers and to external standards. There are minor adjustments required in some of the indicators and some of the questions, but the basic idea of using transformative knowledge forms works. Second, we found data gaps in the area regarding e-vehicles and charging infrastructure, the budget for mobility solutions, and the availability of mobility infrastructures, for example, mobility hubs. And finally, the entire report is available on the Sprout website under the link that's indicated here. And it's called D6.2 Evidence-Based Early Policy Alert and Action Tracking. Thank you for listening.